Okay, so is is anybody seeing this meeting in the the Teams calendar, or are you guys just using the Canvas Teams page? What you eating, Kylie? Dinner. It's gourmet. It's ramen noodles. Awesome. Ooh. Um, I see it in Teams. Okay, so what I'm getting is um, some people are seeing it in Teams, some people aren't. Elizabeth was having a hard time getting onto the meeting and she just used last week's link. So um, there, I know that there's at least three or four different ways that you can get on. The system is supposed to be sending you, uh, they should, it should have sent you a link when they first set up this meeting for you to respond saying you're gonna attend or not. And then it should be sending you a link the day of the meeting. It should be also in the Canvas Teams page and it should be on your team's calendar. So if you guys aren't seeing all those, um, there's I can't I haven't been able to do anything. I don't know what I can do. But what you can do is contact your tech guys or whatever. And um, because if you go to your page where you get your email, or go to Canvas, on the left hand side is a vertical bar, and at the very bottom it says Live Help, which I guess is good because if it was dead help, they wouldn't be able to answer any questions. But if you go to that and just uh, start typing in, uh, I don't know, a good nine times out of 50, somebody will re respond pretty quickly. Or more often. Kylie has been pointing out several dead links that we find we're, uh, that she's finding in the canvas. And I've been trying to uh, fix those. So if you guys come across a link that is not working, let me know. Every once in a while, the link doesn't work because there's a block on your computer that somebody helpfully installed when they came over to visit your, uh, check their email or something. But uh, most of the time, if the link isn't working, it's probably because it's dead. And if you just let me know, either I will find an alternative or I will um, cut it out completely. So, you know, e either way. Uh, and I think that with the, the latest one, we found some other stuff that does, covers pretty much the same information. It was on Jan uh, Van Arp, and uh, I, I think we got it covered. So I appreciate it when you guys let me know stuff like that, because it helps me to figure it out and fix it. So um, anybody get arrested or blown up with fireworks this last week? Is there a lot of sighs of resignation that nothing happened? Well, I'm sorry to hear that. My oldest daughter, a couple of years ago, she she and her husband and then some couple friends were really bored. They went on Geneva Road. Strike that. Uh, pretend I just heard about this from somebody and I have no direct connection to anybody involved. But uh, somebody they observed thought it would be fun to light this old abandoned couch on fire right there, just a couple blocks north of uh, Maverick. Do you know what I'm talking about? That field that's just a little bit north of the auto parts place. And so somebody lit it on fire and it just got, it caught on fire a lot worse than anybody thought. And um, this certain unnamed person I have absolutely no direct connection with said the flames were like 20 feet high within less than half a minute. I mean, it just it just blew up. So they had no idea what to do. They just stood there staring at it like deers in the headlight. And uh, a couple of police cars stopped by. And uh, I don't know, she said that uh, they looked like they were trying really hard not to laugh because nobody was getting hurt or anything. But I guarantee whoever owned that couch originally is not gonna be happy. But if nobody got arrested, there's no really good story. So let's go ahead and, and continue. <laughs> I'm glad you guys showed up today. I am recording this. And uh, we're going to be covering a few things. Um, there, there's a couple of things that if you haven't done yet, it's not that big of a deal. And uh, if nobody's done it, then we'll talk about it again a little bit next week. But uh, what we're going to be covering today, we're going to talk a little bit about becoming a diversity collaborator. 
we're going to be talking a little bit about artistic critique. I'm going to ask for uh, a couple volunteers. We're going to be talking about what abstraction is and how to do it. And we're going to be talking about your biomorphic um, carving, abstraction carving, and paper mache later on. So, um, and I am also, uh, I have been doing grading. People have seen that. There's been a couple things where uh, people have done answers in the comments section, but if you don't tell me, the system does not alert me. So if your grade has not changed after you've made a change in the comments system, I think Elizabeth was really good about letting me know. And so we, we are able to take care of that really fast. But if anybody has an issue and you've resubmitted and I haven't done anything, just let me know, okay? And I uh, will be all caught up on everything by Friday. Uh, afternoon. I, you guys know that my house flooded, right? I told you about that. The water main broke. This was several months ago. And we tore up the, I say we, my wife found that she had a, almost a spiritual connection with a neighbor's jackhammer. And she tore up the floor like you would not believe. I have never seen a human being so happy. Uh, it, she had a really good time. And I've been putting new flooring down just finished the living room. We moved the furniture inside again, which is really nice. No pigeons nested in it. And but that's and I'm just finishing off the last couple rooms. So that's been keeping me a little bit busy. But I should still have all the grading up to date uh, by Friday night. All right. So I am going to do a fancy schmancy screen share. If I can. and we will get started with stuff. I'm gonna be a tech whiz and do several screen shares today. And you guys are just gonna be blown away that anybody over 30 can actually use a computer. All right, does everybody see this one? It's a class discussion, how can we be effective diversity collaborators? I see it. All right, good. For this, I, I want to talk a, a little bit about it today. And then I also want people to post their stuff on um, a discussion, the discussion board. You get credit for posting, but I haven't allowed for any responding. You guys, I mean, I haven't graded any responding. If you guys want to respond, that would be absolutely terrific. Uh, you know, sharing with each other what you're, what you're learning and what you think about what they posted. Um, this topic, I think, can be really uncomfortable for a lot of people. And I think, but I think it is completely valid to be talking about. What we're talking about is the, the fiction, and I'm, I'm gonna say this and I'll explain myself, the fiction of different races. Now I say that because there is there is one race, human race, but uh, the different variations we have in skin tone and height and size and shape and coloration and all that kind of stuff, those are all within the parameters of the, the uh, statistical spread of DNA expression. And there is no specific way that you can really say that this person or that person are a completely different human being because of how they look externally. And I, I say this, and of course, a lot of this is my opinion, but we can also look at critical race theory, and there is some really good um, studies and work being that have been done on critical race theory. And I'm not talking about the CNN or Fox News short version of critical race theory. I'm talking about the actual stuff. And what is interesting to me is that the idea of people looking different and having us use that as a determinant as to more or less humanity in the individual is a fairly recent development. Human beings have been on this planet for, well, the, and I'm talking about Denisovans, um, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon, uh, they all blended together. A big reason that they, they disappeared from the fossil record is that they um, 
blended together. It wasn't that, you know, modern humans killed everybody else out. It just, it, it, there's a lot of evidence to show that these three groups of very similar types of people blended together to create us today. Like if you have red hair, like two of my daughters, that's uh, one of the more visual cues that you have uh, um, Neanderthal DNA, uh, which, which is interesting. Also, there's uh, Denisovan DNA in there as well. But um, the way that people have kind of differentiated or uh, expressed prejudice uh, before now has, has usually been an indicator of um, or an expression is whether or not they belong. And I put that in air quotes. Belonging, for example, the Diné or Navajo, everybody who's not Diné is something else. They don't belong. Uh, if you were, for example, in Northern Europe, a Viking, anybody that wasn't a member of your direct clan did not belong. Um, who knew that the, the first Roman emperor to conquer uh, England was uh, a black African? Did you guys know that? His name was Severin. And uh, what is really interesting about him is that nobody knew because they had his, his portrait there in stone until somebody started uh, examining microscopic flecks of paint that were still there 2000 years later. And then they started learning that this guy, his family became citizens from a conquered Roman territory and then he became Caesar, which I, I thought was, was pretty freakishly cool. In the Roman empire, if you were not a member of the Roman community, it didn't matter what you look like or what language you spoke, uh, if, you, if you were able to speak, also speak the official language, you know, Latin, and you claimed the rights of a Roman, uh, not citizen, but a, a Roman society member, you were a Roman regardless of where your family came from. But if you weren't Roman, you spoke as a barbar or um, a barbarian. And we can go around the world and see this kind of thing where if you are not a member of the specific group, I'm going to turn off screen share for just a bit and we'll go back to it in just a sec. But if you are not a member of the specific group, however people chose to define it, then you were, you had less human rights than other people. Uh, when the Prophet Muhammad uh, started receiving the revelation of the Quran about 610, uh, one of the first communities he went to was an area called Medina which is north and just a shade east of Mecca. And there, there was a lot of strife. A lot of people hated each other because of clans, families, religious expression. And it wasn't even that some people were Jewish, some people were Christian, and some people were Muslim. It was more that this person or that person was the right or wrong kind of Christian, Jew, or Muslim. You know, it was basically arbitrary distinctions that people used to exhibit prejudice, essentially. And one of the amazing things that uh, the prophet did was forge one of the earliest um, constitutions in, the hi in history. And uh, he, he never learned to read or write, so he figured these things out, spoke them to a scribe, and then that person would write them down. But he was able to generate or craft a constitution where everybody's rights were ex expressed and supported. And uh, even conscientious objectors, there was a, a legal way for them to abstain from participating in violent conflict. And uh, one of the reasons why he designed the mosque and one of the reasons why Muslims use Friday as a holy day is because he wanted Christians and Jews to be able to worship in the same building space you know, and share a community. So you have the Jewish community celebrating their Sabbath on Saturday and the Christian community celebrating their Sabbath on Sunday. And the only reason that's important is that, that um, that's an example of people being different working together anyway. So as you guys went over this assignment and looked at it, have any of you generated ideas or found examples that you could share with us about 
say, for example, art being used as something divisive, uh, pretty much the indicators of race. Oh, I, I didn't forget. I didn't finish my thought. I'm sorry. The re one of the main reasons um, race is being used today, or we're we're so conscious of race, is really an aspect of colonialism that started in um, I want to say about the 15th century, maybe a little bit earlier. Actually, probably had generated in, in uh, the Crusades. But uh, when Isabel and Ferdinand were given pretty much the incentive by the Pope to find new lands to um, convert, uh, as people started discovering different areas, they, they figured, okay, well, we're, if we're a stronger country, we have firearms, we're gonna go into these communities, scare the snot out of them, convince them that they're less human than us and that it's our God-given right to steal from them. And that's how uh, this kind of really um, international tribalism really started picking up strength. And then we look at one of the examples of racism rearing its head here in the Americas. Um, I don't know if you, have you ever learned about indentured servitude? When uh, families would send their children to the new world for a better future, it was a contract saying, oh, well, they'll work with a, a really friendly family, get to stay with that family, be a part of that family until they work off the cost of their passage. And they became indentured servants. What this quickly became was people over in the Americas hated the fact that other people would send their kids. And they figured that if their families didn't want them, the kids were less than human and they treated them worse than dirt. And they were, it was essentially white um, slavery on a, a huge scale. And when these people realized that they were had a lot of in alliance with the people that had been kidnapped from Africa and sold as well, they started forming communities together. And uh, the landowners here in the US could not handle that or didn't want that to happen. And that's when they started dividing them with ideas of one religion being better than another and, or I'm sorry, they didn't start using that. Everybody's always used that, but they started really publicizing it, publishing it, it quite a bit and making it a lot stronger statement that uh, different religions needed to separate and different colors needed to separate. And that's when you start seeing in the English language um, derogatory terms regarding color used to separate black slaves from the white indentured servants or the white slaves. So it was very, this consciousness that we have today is definitely not a fiction, but it's derived from this development of uh, divide and conquer politics that was used to defend the rights of rather selfish people um, in the Americas. Now, I'm not saying that everybody as part of that program was nasty, that, not at all. What I am saying is that it had its origins, or we can show that it, um, there's a good chance it had it or, its origins with some of the nasty people that were part of that society. So that, and, and that, that's where we see that uh, beginning to develop. And then the, the Portuguese, French, uh, uh, Dane, Holland, and other countries started uh, copying that as well and using it to a uh, great political effect as they divided up chunks of Africa and did the same thing. And even into the Middle East and into the East, into China and uh, Southeast Asia. You can, you can really see that quite a bit. Anyway, so that, that thought is completed. I've completed the full circle thought. Now we're gonna go back to this discussion thing. Sigh, okay. All right, and my example was how is art used to, to divide? Do you, remember, do you guys remember what this is from last week? Does anybody remember? It was like the way they, it was in Russia that they would like determine if someone was dangerous or not. Yeah, it was a, a Soviet racial profiling uh, starting right after World War II. And, and, and they were saying, yeah, these are the criminals you gotta watch out for. These are the, the racial types that are have proclivities 
towards criminal activity. And this is how we're going to identify the criminals. What are, what are some of the big differences that you can see between these people? Your what hair. I see is, yeah, I see hair and I see eyes. I mean, like that number three is the stereotypical uh, European TV show villain, you know, with the, with the nasty eyes. I, I see um, eyebrows. And what's interesting to me is that color does not come into this, but this is a racial profiling chart. Isn't that interesting? I, I just think it, it's fascinating that you can determine a person's criminality by whether or not they have a specific hairline. That would save so many problems. Has anybody come up with or seen other examples that, they, that they'd be comfortable sharing with us? Now, as we go into this discussion, I want people to know that we are not looking at anybody to become the spokes, other than me, to become the spokes model for whatever group they're representing. I say that other than me because whenever there's a national campaign where they're looking for a white person, it's me. I am the stereotypical American white American male. I, you cannot get more stereotypical than me. But uh, if anybody else wants to talk, we will accept that your experiences are your own and nobody else's and you won't have to speak for anybody else. What kinds of things have you, have you seen anything in the news lately where art has been used as a way to divide human beings? Every once in a while, I will, we can see the stuff from uh, World War II. There's some really nasty cartoons, especially from uh, US newspapers talking about um, Tito and Mussolini and Hitler and those guys, you know, just really nas um, nasty depictions. Yes, Kylie. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <clears throat> Um, I was just looking at a couple earlier today and I found one It was like a comic strip and it was supposed to like be to help Americans distinguish between a Chinese person and a Japanese person. Um, and there were just some like ridiculous things like the space between toes and just some silly things that they were using to, to try and differentiate between the two groups. Um, so a piece I thought was interesting and also silly. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think stuff like that, I don't, I can't speak to the person's intent. Maybe they're pure, pure in heart, but I agree. Stuff like that where you're measuring differences between toes is kind of ridiculous. And um, I, have, have any of you guys ever seen uh, any of the remakes of Fist of Fury? Okay, well, it's, it's a Hong Kong cinema um, or... Um, type of movie, you know, Kung Fu-y kind of stuff. And uh, Bruce Lee did one of them, but it was about, uh, it was a film, it was basically uh, it's involving Chinese and, and uh, Japanese interaction. And uh, there are some really good examples of art being used to uh, empower racism in, in any of those versions, except Jet Li did one that was really good that I, um, he did a version a little bit later that I thought was really well done. Let's see. Okay, and, and Esther, your hands up. Hi, yeah, um, I'm not sure if you moved on, but <laughs> I had like an idea. I think this is also with people's intentions, not necessarily that the artist with whatever they created, because art could be music, or it could be movies or but i think people are so used to the me versus you um and so if you say you like one artist that can be offensive to another person um and so 
I just, I, it's another perspective of looking at art that art isn't necessarily, some art isn't necessarily meant to be divisive, but people will take it to be that way. And they'll use art in a completely different way than what it was intended. And so I think that also says a lot about people. And I also think that there are like very offensive art pieces and everything, but I think especially in today's world, we're just very, we're always looking for, um, we have that mindset of me versus you. Yeah, it's uh, overly sensitive, sensitive offense sensitivity. Yeah, I think I think that's really good. And I, I know that we could find, a couple just occurred to me too, as you were talking, art where it was developed specifically for a completely different reason by the artist involved, but has been used uh, for something um, very divisive. Yeah, and, and there's there's some really good examples of that. Um, I'm thinking of uh, like iconography in Russian Orthodox churches was used as a really derisive thing as uh, the Soviets were trying, the Soviet government was trying to establish that this was an atheistic state. And, uh, you know, if, if you, um, if you celebrated that kind of art or used it, it was, it show, showed that you were uh, less, uh, you weren't as smart as, as normal human beings and you were of a different caliber of, of uh, or lesser humanity, definitely. But, th but there's also a lot more specific examples too, like music. Um, I was listening to something and I, it wasn't LL Cool J. Oh, I, I want to say it was somebody like Common, you know, that caliber of recording artist. He was talking about, somebody asked him about um, the birth of, of um, rap. And he actually credited William Shatner. Because uh, William Shatner after Star Trek, you guys know who William Shatner is, Captain Kirk, the original? Uh, he started doing psychedelic rock and spoken word poetry. And oh, what's the name? Leader, lead singer for Black Flag. A uh, really good example of the American punk, punk rock movement. He talked about how um, William Shatner uh, paved the way for American punk rock. And then you get somebody like Common talking about how he paved the way for rap. And then LL Cool J and a bunch of other guys were talking about how um, uh, Eminem was the preeminent rapper. And you know that that's music that we can look at that has been used by many people as a very divisive kind of tool, and it, it was not intended to be that way. So yeah, I think that's an excellent example, Esther. Now I want to move to something that's a little bit more pleasant. And um, remember, I don't know if you guys remember my example from last week, where I talked about good examples. And um, one thing I liked about that was that uh, you look at the, the Ottomans and there was a lot of nasty stuff that happens in every government around the world. But one of the good things that the Ottomans did in Turkey after the fall of Constantinople from the Christians and it being renamed Istanbul, Mehmet II was walking in to Hagia Sophia, which was one of the, the landmarks world landmark of Constantinople architecture is done by Christians as a Christian church. And his men started coming in and stealing the gold and stuff like that off the walls. And he had his horse stomp and he said, you cannot do this. This is a house of God. It is a worship site. It will remain a worship site. And so he had his people uh, keep Hagia Sophia. And what was so remarkable is that the Muslim Turks used the architecture of the Hagia Sophia to inform all future Muslim architecture. So this is a Christian building being used as the model for mosques. And you can still see that echoed in mosques around the world today. Um, and it is one of the very few examples of an active worship space where there are actual depictions of human beings in the building uh, in connection with uh, uh, Muslim worship which I, I thought was absolutely fascinating. Can anybody guess what the sacred uh, images are that they that are left intact in the mosque? 
imagine one or somewhere of Christ. <clears throat> yeah. Baby Jesus, his, his mother Mary, and his stepfather uh, Joseph. Uh, when uh, the Prophet Muhammad cleaned out the Kaaba in Mecca from centuries of pagan use, he cleared all the images, all the pagan images out. There was only one painting that he left in. Can anybody guess what that was a painting of? Again, it was the baby Jesus sitting on his mom's lap. So I, I, th I think that's really, that's absolutely fascinating to me. But can anybody else think of any good examples of art being used as something that is unifying? One thing that I'm thinking of that is a little bit odd, when the British uh, conquered New Zealand, conquered the Maori, uh, one of the things that they did was outlaw moko, and moko is traditional tattooing. Everybody, I'm not gonna say everybody because I, I don't know, but it was typical for a Maori to identify themselves with their moko or their traditional tattoos. This is the style of tattooing that Jason Momoa had all over his rippling muscles in Aquaman, you know? I know you guys have seen that movie. And Emily's smile is just a little bit too big. But, <laughs> but it was outlawed uh, from, from the 1800s forward. And a friend of mine, about 30, 40 years ago, started exploring this and he did some really heavy deep dive research and found where this was. He's a native Maori and um, he started bringing it back. And um, the, the government of New Zealand was pretty much forced to, well, not forced, everybody agreed to strike all those negative laws off the books. And my friend was invited, to, and you can look this up on YouTube, to do full leg uh, pants tattoos of traditional Maori moko designs on a model at um, the, the Federal Museum, you know, the, the National Museum there in New Zealand. And that tattooing now, we look at uh, that fused with Balinese tattoos, that is what is used to signify super cool characters in comic book movies now. I mean, that style of tattooing informed the design of Aquaman's armor as well as his tattoos. But you look at um, a lot of these comic book characters that have tattoos or the most striking tattoos that you see, a lot of them are informed regardless of you know, the, the background or ethnicity of the person, of the character, a lot of them are informed by those striking, the striking imagery of Moko. And uh, what is so amazing about that is that uh, Moko, uh, there are stories that are told in those tattoos where um, a lot of the times we just see striking designs. It's that they're actually stories. And uh, I learned from my friend that the only legitimate tattoo is one that you earn and you can pay for it too, but one that you buy out of a design book is not real moco. So, you know, when Esther, when you're, I want you to reconsider that along your sleeve, your ta um, sleeve tattoo you're thinking about, you know, it needs to be a real story. But, um, Anybody else have any examples of positive of art being used to unify? Would like a flag count? I, I know that there are some flags that are can be divisive, but I, I think you're right. I believe it's the Georgia flag that is particular, the Georgia state flag is particularly wonderful because of that. It was completely revamped and redesigned and it was redesigned to unify all the many people in Georgia, including the indig indigenous people. You know, they had, a, um, uh, indigenous nations had a, had a hand in designing the um, Georgia state flag. I think it's also true of the Oklahoma state flag. So yeah, that, that's an excellent example. 
Anybody else? One more example, then we're moving on. Kylie. Um, so the one I was thinking of, and maybe this is borderline too, but it was actually a Barbie that came out not too long ago. Um, it was based off of a fencer named Ibtahaj Muhammad. Um, and she is a Muslim fencer and she wears a hijab. And so she's very modest in covers. And that's not something that had ever been featured in a Barbie. Um, but they ended up featuring her and, and that part of her culture in a Barbie. So I thought that was really cool. That is really cool because Barbie is a powerful brand. Um, yeah, very definitely. Excellent. That, that is a really good example. So I have a couple of monitors that I'm turning off so I don't look even more blue. But as you go through this, I want you to spend the next uh, week or so looking for both positive and negative examples. And when you put them on the discussion, please don't just put up the example. Please share why you think it's good or bad. Good one first, I mean, bad one first and good one next, you know, second. Um, and there's some things to consider. My, my sister is Shoshone. And um, indigenous Americans for a long time, their religions were outlawed by the federal government. And those laws were still on the books into the nineties. Uh, there were some, there were specific dances that could not be performed, specific things that could not be done. And what, what excited me is that um, Brigham Young University underwrites powwow, a get together of every native, um, every indigenous nation that can come, uh, they have powwows at BYU and they're a huge supporter of uh, indigenous culture in North America. Um, there are uh, scholarships that every year are given to uh, men and women in this community. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Lacey, who's a, a pastor of the Native American church, was a Ute, um, he was one of the first people that they contacted when they uh, did the Olympic Committee um, in, back in 2002, uh, because every religion had to be, there had to be a worship space for somebody from every religion. And so they made sure to include the Native American church. Um, the University of Utah, this is what I love. Every year, there are self-righteous lawyers that will attack University of Utah, saying that the mascot is completely racist. What they don't know is that University of Utah works with the Ute Council and uh, other Native nations in, in Utah. There's, there's seven, um, five main ones, and then uh, a couple others that, that have um, traveled. But uh, they, they, every year they, they work with the, um, the Ute Council to uh, tweak the mascot, make sure it's respectful, uh, work with them. You know, it, what, what's the, what can we do with this? And, and uh, they have a really tight connection with scholarships and, and help going both ways with um, the Ute Nation in Utah. And it, it's always fun to see um, the lawyers get knocked down a peg. <laughs> I, I just, I find that humorous. But uh, I want you to, to look at this positive, negative examples. And if you guys want to comment on each other's, that'd be great but your grade specifically comes from posting the, the negative that you find and the positive that you find. As, um, as artists, I think art should only be used to create. And sometimes that can be ugly when you're creating something it, that forces people to look at the world around them and realize it's not how everybody wants to be, but it should not be destructive or hateful, I think. Um, and as artists, it can only help us to expand our awareness and support voices that are different than our own. I mean, everybody was made for a reason. Everybody's here for a reason. Everybody has a voice for a reason. And in art, not only do we have the right to share our voice, but I think it's, it's invaluable. Our, our voices are necessary. Every voice is necessary. It's not just a good thing to have diversity in art. I think it absolutely validates art as a whole 
to uh, strengthen and collaborate with that diversity. But uh, moving on to the next thing, I wanted to talk about artistic critique. Who can give me the first step, the first tool of artistic critique? It's a description. Excellent. You're talking about how it impacts the shared world. Very good. Uh, what are some of the words that you would use or what are some of the things that you would use as you are applying that first tool of artistic critique? What are some of the aspects of whatever it is that you're looking at that you'd share? Uh, an easy one is measurements. How big is it? How little is it? What's another one? Maybe just describing various formal elements. Um, like you just said, size, color, um, maybe like what is it that you see? Yeah, excellent, very good. I think some of the other ones might be um, material. Is there an easily identifiable material or a style? Sometimes we can see a very strong style in the art. Like if we're looking at architecture, you can usually tell if it's been influenced by Soviet brutalism or the American version of mission style. You know, I, I think that's really good. What is the second step or second tool? Analyze. Excellent. All right. And what are some of the aspects you think about or share when you're analyzing something? What's going on in your head? Everybody's curious, what's the first question you ask? Like either what is it or what is it about? Oh yeah, you're right. Okay, what's the next question you ask? How did you make it? Oh yeah. You know, how, how, did, how did they use the materials are, um, to put this together? How did they support it? How did they, make use uh, materials to create that technique or that visual effect. So yeah, excellent. What is the third tool of artistic critique? Rhiannon or Oliver, you, wanna, you guys wanna chime in? See, I am sharing something. The third one is interpretation. By looking at the art, do you think that there's a possibility we have a window into the person, the artist's worldview? Does anybody think that there's a possibility we could see how they think about the world? Yeah, definitely. I think so. There are other questions we can ask you. Know, what's important to them? Uh, what is the purpose? Do you think that they had in making this thing? Now, if you look at these kinds of questions, these tools, the first one, we're just observing. The second one, we're kind of guessing at how it was made. The third one, we're starting to get more in the artist's head. So each of these, we're applying more and more of ourselves at this object or thing that we're, we're examining. Can you see that? Now, whether or not you're right or wrong about um, interpreting something is less important than if you are able to express which view, visual cues you are seeing that bring you to that conclusion. You know, what is your line of reasoning? That's the valuable element of being able to interpret something. If you're at a family gathering and some you, you tell somebody, well, yeah, it's obvious this piece, the person was angry, and your aunt, uncle, or great aunt Nedna, or whatever, they ask, well, how do you arrive to that conclusion? Then you can just you know, use your, your uh, 50 cent words, your um, 
big vocabulary to describe the elements that you're point that you're you focused on and how that came to be and why you think that justifies your interpretation. And then you will sound not only smart, but super smart. If you look at this page, Artistic Critique My Own Work, um, this first video link is an excellent example of people applying these tools to um, a particular sculpture. Now, a lot of the times when you do this, what's fascinating to me, you can't really get by with doing this just over a minute or two. You really have to look at something for a while, asking yourself internally these questions. And then as you start talking about it, it's amazing how much more you see. Uh, and we're gonna talk about this again next week too, a little bit. When you apply the tools of artistic critique, I want to see if there's examples of greater respect or complete turnaround on your point of view of something because you were able to apply the, the tools of, excuse me, because you were able to apply the tools of artistic critique and think with intent about whatever it is that we're looking at. Now, um, on this, I also include a link to that page that shows the intro to the tools of artistic critique. And this takes you to a page that shows you, um, let's see, can everybody see this new tab? Can you guys see this? This shows you uh, just a short description of the tools of artistic critique. And then it also, you'll also be able to see, let's see, if you go to the next, These are the tools, and under each one are several different questions. Can everybody see that? So what is the last of the four steps of the tools of artistic critique? Evaluate. Yes, excellent, evaluate. And that's where you kind of talk, you just talk about why you think that this thing is valid, why you think it's other than valid, if it's successful, if it's not successful. I think that a really good question to ask yourself is, is it successful? Because that is rather open-ended and you can use all your vocabulary to talk about the, the visual cues that allow you to determine whether or not something is successful. And I would like everybody to make sure that you go to this playlist and watch some of these. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, and some of them are exactly in between, but actually most of them are, are, are pretty good. The application of the tools of artistic critique, that gives you a playlist of what other students have done for this assignment. Now, do I have any volunteers of somebody who would like to record a three to five minute critique applying the, in, to, for example, one of your own works that you made for this class, or one of the houseworks, for example, that you saw in the discussion board. Would uh, anybody like to volunteer to do that? And if you don't want to do it with us next week, what you can do is do the video yourself with a voiceover and then send me the email uh, link to that or send me the file so I can share it with everybody. All right. I would really like to get two of you to volunteer um, to do it by next Tuesday, simply because this is one of those things that a lot of people like to put off until the very end. And it's not due until the very end of the term, but it would, it would really help you to get it up, done and out of the way. Anybody want to volunteer to do either an artistic critique of their own work or an artistic critique of somebody else's work? And again, it has to be one piece that is made for this class this term. OK, if nobody's going to volunteer, We'll talk Tuesday again. There will be more stuff online. 
and then you guys, I'll need a couple of volunteers then. So be thinking about that between now and then, all right? Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is abstraction. Does anybody remember what the um, abstraction thing? Let's see. I'm going to get to that. What uh, the the text spoke or said about abstraction? Are you looking for like a definition or something else? Well, I, I, there were a couple words that they used. Um, simplify was one. Design was another one. And I am a little bit irritated because I had set this up so you guys could see um, my little PowerPoint thing I put together. And I'm disappointed because the PowerPoint was amazing. Okay, here we go. Now, if you guys want to cry or anything, or you want your copy for yourself, that would be just fine. Okay, can everybody see this? Yeah. Can everybody see this? Okay. Let's see. All right, is that better or worse? Okay, we can see, at least we can see the whole image. Obviously, what is this? I even tree. labeled it to help you. Yeah. Does it look like a naturalistic tree? Yes. Looks like some simplification yeah. there, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is, my grandpa said that art was art if you could see it out the window. So this is perfectly the kind of stuff that my grandpa would love. Now, look at this. Can anybody tell me? Where are the trees in this image? The like more defined ones are going to be in the foreground, but it's like the simple shapes they use kind of defines the ones that go throughout the horizon. Yeah, these, um, as you get close to the mountains, they kind of disappear. But these ones on the left-hand side are really naturalistic, aren't they? Yeah, this this is an example, an excellent example of the American uh, movement called Hudson River School, and it involves kind of like a, a romanticized vision of nature. But you can see that very strong, powerful trees. I would say that this is pretty naturalistic as well. Now, if we go to this next image, what is one of the big what are some of the big differences between this image and the one before? Where's the tree? Can everybody see the tree? Yeah, it's right smack in the middle, isn't it? But does it look like a naturalistic tree? I'd have to say absolutely not. You know, if we go up to here, even though this is romanticized, we can still tell very much that it's a natural looking tree. If we go here, all the branches, can everybody see my mouse? Yes. OK, you see all the branches here are pretty much on the same plane. All the branches, all the twigs separating from each branch are on either side of it. What do you notice about the flowers? What are the two faces that we see in the flowers? There's the front or the side, but we don't see anything else. Yeah, how often have you seen flowers grow naturally where they're, they look like they're posing for the camera, you know? And these birds too, they're all very poised. You see the profile of the bird, some of them have heads uh, pointing forward and some of them are looking over their shoulder. What do you notice about the leaves? They all look the exact same. Yeah, they're, they're identical. So this is an example as we're moving towards abstraction where the person, where the artist is starting to simplify uh, the design elements and turning it almost into a pattern. 
Would you, do you think you'd ever see a tree like this in real life? No. No, I don't think so. So this is one of the early steps towards abstraction. Now look at this. This is the state flag of New Hampshire. This is the tree of liberty. Can you identify it as a tree? It's like a silhouette. Yeah, it is incredibly simplified, isn't it? We have the vertical line of the trunk. We have like the top of the root ball right there. And we have this kind of jaggedy triangle that represents the top of the tree. I Would you say that this is more abstract or naturalistic? I would say it's somewhere in between. It is a naturalistic silhouette, but it is very abstracted. It is very simplified. Would you guys freak out and start screaming if you actually saw something like this in the middle of a field growing? I mean, that would make me super uncomfortable. Now, what is this? Can anybody tell me what this is? Is it kanji for tree? Yeah, exactly. Where's the trunk? Middle, vertical. Yeah, where's the horizon? Top, middle-ish, kind of <laughs> horizontal. Yeah, it, it's a line that's going side to side. And where are the slope of the branches? It's the diagonal bits. Yeah, so you can still see the tree there, but would you say this is more naturalistic or abstract? Abstract. Yeah, very much. But can you, you see that progression where we start from naturalistic, romanticized, stylistic, even uh, simplified, and then very abstracted? Now look at this. Can anybody see the trees in this? I would hazard a guess that there's a tree and here's a tree. And there might be a tree right there. If they are trees, what would signify them as trees? What are the visual cues? The fact that they're green. Yeah, just the color. Isn't that interesting? So it doesn't look like a tree at all, except for very vaguely. But in, it's incredibly simplified from these other things. And it's almost like a spurt of emotion that's put on the canvas. But yeah, but this, this is how we get to abstraction, where we're picking particular features of the natural thing, and we're simplifying them, and we're um, exaggerating them. So in this case, everything is simplified except for the color. The color is exaggerated, because that's the only color that we see. Now. Where's the tree in this? Right here. This is actually a landscape by an artist named Pete Mondrian. And it is a landscape. Isn't that amazing? Do you think this is more naturalistic or abstract? Definitely abstract. Yeah, it is abstracted to the point where it is impossible to tell what it actually is unless you have outside information, isn't it? And here, you know, I when I used to show this slide, people would say, oh, you're so full of baloney. But here's, these are all by the same artist, Pete Mondrian. And this is his earliest one, top left. And his this is his latest one bottom right. And they are all six of the same tree. Isn't that interesting? This looks vaguely naturalistic. I mean, we have kind of an organic trunk going on. What are some of the abstract elements creeping into it? I'd say uh, we get 
very strong impressionistic uh, impressionism where the colors are being used to express changes in coloration as opposed to actual color. And the colors are also used to express uh, emotion or time of day as opposed to what it's actually seen. Can anybody else see those kinds of things in that? Okay. Now, if we look at the next one, this one, what do you do with the color? Remove the color. Yeah, it's almost all gone. What do you do with the branches and, and trunk? They're a lot less natural than they felt before. Now they're really gestural. Yeah, yeah. very. They're simplified and they're very emotive. You know, what's, what was interesting to me about uh, Pete Mondrian was born at a time when all of a sudden people were using trains, automobiles, and steamships. You could get around the world in a couple months when your parents had to spend several months and even maybe a year or two to get all the way around the world. People started having uh, telegraph lines and stuff nearby in the cities. Roads were congested because people rode around with more than just their feet or their horses. And the world was becoming just ridiculously busy. When you can get a communication, you know, at this time that he was active, all of a sudden you could get a communication across the Atlantic in a matter of moments. I mean, just the world was a, expanding and moving rapidly at a pace that was entirely unprecedented. And I, I think, my, my personal opinion, looking at what Pete Mondrian was doing, was he was trying to express the cityscape and uh, his environment around him, but expressing it in a way that was simplifying as much as possible. We look at the top right one. Can you guys still see the tree in that, on those lines? Yeah, it, but it's, it's a lot simpler, isn't it? with that. And it's still very much organic, but it is a lot simpler. And then we come down here. What kind of, even though this is still a tree, what does this remind you of? Mosaic. Yeah, it looks like a, a mosaic. It doesn't look very much like those sweeping curving lines of tree branches. It also makes me think of like a, a city block map. Can anybody else see that in there? Now, what's he doing between this one and the middle one in the bottom? What's he doing with the color? Making it pretty flat. Yeah, he's simplifying and flattening it. What's he doing with the lines? Making them they are very much so. What's that? Oh, Sorry? Go ahead. No, I think I was ahead. looking at, actually at the wrong one. I was going to say making them thicker and darker, but I think I'm looking at the one on the uh, bottom right. And you're talking about the one on yeah. the bottom. Sorry. Uh, and, but, but that's a good way. We'll, we'll move into that. Yeah, they're, they're thicker and darker. What is also, what's he also doing with the colors here? He's simplifying them even more. By the end of his life, he was painting with essentially primary colors and green, and that's it. But if I tell you this is the horizon line, these are paths in a park, this is a tree, and this represents a, the sky or a cloud, can you see those things? Where is the trunk in the tree? It's about right here. And the branches are here and here. But Pete Mondrian was trying, was really trying to express a more simplified world from the just the absolute absurd craziness of the modern realm 
there were actually articles where people thought you'd go back in time if you ever were in a machine that would go faster than 40 miles an hour. Do you believe that? But can you can you see how ab abstraction will take different elements and simplify them, parse them down, make the colors more emotive as opposed to naturalistic? Some of the lines are emphasized that the artist is attracted to. Some of them are removed completely. But these are the kinds of things I want you to think about as you go into this biomorphic abstraction carving. Uh, some of the really nice things that work are uh, bone structures, coral structures, plant forms, but not realistic plant forms. Maybe you like the vein structure on the back of one leaf and you really like how uh, knuckle bones relate to each other. When you carve, combine those together. That could be really interesting. But and look at some of the examples. There are there are some examples there as well. Also look at the paper mache thing. Um, Jason did those paper mache things and he showed some good examples there. Look at the artists that are in this uh, grouping of artists and the kind of work that they've done to see what kinds of stuff they explore when you no longer have to be bound by even uh, putting the pressure on yourself for somebody else understanding what you're doing. It doesn't matter. The important thing is making this carving flow and being organic and abstract. So, so that, that's what we're looking for. Uh, some good things that people have looked at as they're getting ready for this are images of pollen and single-celled animals, algae, uh, just uh, close-up models of human cells, viruses, like I said, uh, bones. You know, all the, all the fossil evidence of humans for the last 150,000 years can be put into the bed of a pickup truck. But there's some really cool looking stuff. If, if you look at fossils, there's some incredibly awesome looking stuff. Some other forms that I think are really cool to look at are um, eroded stones. If you look at wind erosion, particularly with um, uh, sandstone, that can look that can be remarkable. I wanted to look at the quiz really quick with you too. Let's see. Look at this. As you go through the textbook for this, I, what I'm noticing is that you guys are being really careful with looking at the textbook with the questions, and that makes my job so much easier. Thank you very much. Here we have an idea. What is the difference between form and shape? If we're talking 3D in a 3D class, that would be pretty obvious, isn't it? What is, what is the shape generally, 2D or 3D? 2D. Yeah. And what is a form generally, 2D or 3D? 3D. Yeah. So that you just answered that question. Excellent work. We can go through here. This is really pretty um, interesting. This, these materials are most often used in the subtraction process. What kind of thing do you do with the subtraction process? Uh, what set of tools would you use? Would you use things like hammers ch and chisels and um, uh, knives, or for the subtraction process, would you use things like a welder and a hammer and nails? We're talking about tools, not to, what's that? Yeah, the first, because the subtraction process is taking things away. So as you look at what are the materials, think about, you know, look in the text, what are the things that people carve? Now, I, I did want to ask this question. We just looked at abstraction. Abstraction is based on the observable world because it simplifies what you see. What is the distinction between abstraction and non-objective or non-representational? Does anybody know? 
I can take a shot at it. Okay. <clears throat> um, so something that's non-objective or non-representational is something that an artist can base on like a recognizable um, object or scene, whereas an abstract uh, piece is based on something recognizable. But in the simplification process, you may or may not be able to recognize it later. So like that that piece where it was just the, the landscape and the tree was represented with the blue, without having any context, I wouldn't have been able to guess that. Um, but because it was inspired by something real, it's abstract and it's not non-objective. Yeah, that is excellent. Very good. I, I think a, another good example would be... Um, English letters are generally going to be non-objective, but kanji, there's a lot of kanji that is abstract. You know, just like the kanji uh, word for tree or a kanji image for tree, it is abstract, even though you don't recognize it right away. And that is true for a lot of ideoglyphic uh, language. But um, you know, American numbers, American letters, they're, they're purely symbolic with very little, if any, uh, real world root to be abstractions of. So yeah, I, Kylie, that that is that is perfect, excellent. And we can go down. I don't want to go over all the questions. This is a good one though that I, I want to be you to be aware of. Question number nine: Representational or figurative forms are those that are, relate directly to the human body. Is that true or false? And what is fascinating to me is that a lot of people that do anatomy and work with um, game design will say, yeah, that's absolutely true. When, uh, rep because that's how you describe what you do as representation or figurative. But representation or figurative forms, they deal with real world envir environments. So they could also be animals. It doesn't have to be just human. All right. So that's clue in for number nine. Some pretty pictures right there. We're talking about living rock, and that's good to look for. I think when you are looking at your textbook, I would go over the quiz first and then go over the text and find the answers to the questions. OK. And then this number 12, what's important on number 12 is you're going to write static and dynamic forms, and then you're going to give a short definition for both static and dynamic forms. So static forms and dynamic forms, all right? So you're actually going to give eight short definitions. So an interior form might be something on the inside perimeter of a sculptural piece. An exterior form might be the silhouette of the sculptural piece. That's how long those definitions need to be, all right? And then this one, I, if any of you guys have done every, any carving before in wood or soap or anything, you can answer this through painful personal experience, definitely. So I, the next thing I wanted to talk about really quick is, um, the assignment for this, you have two blocks of foam. One is supposed to be the base for you to, to hold, put things on. You can keep that until the very end. You can use it to photograph stuff on, doesn't matter. But the block that is the thicker through block, and it should be, oh, I'd say about maybe five, six inches thick, six inches by about maybe four or six, and then about 12 inches long, something like that. I don't know what the exact size was, uh, but, those that's what you're going to be using you have uh, a box cutter and you also have um, the, those files to use and any, any other tool you want to use that's fine what i would do is um, kind of get an idea in your head about what kind of thing you want to do when we do this as a semester class i have people work with clay to kind of form it out of clay first and then start carving it but you can, uh, you can go into it. Uh, one really good thing to do is have any of you made a Pinewood Derby car? 
Anybody? Okay. I'm going to do a really clever drawing here. Can everybody see that really clever drawing? It's a, it's kind of a box. That's represents the, the foam that you have. And if you don't have an idea of what you want, one easy way to start working on this is to go through and on one face, draw the silhouette of the object you want to make. Can you kind of see that? And then you're going to carve the extra pieces off. Can everybody see that? And then that will give you a form that is a little step closer to a 3D form. Then you're going to rotate it 90 degrees, draw another silhouette, and carve some more pieces off all the way through. Rotate it, and you can keep going around the whole block like that. And very quickly, it'll take it away from that cube type form um, and start turning it into something more 3D. Now, you can start off with an idea of what you want, or you can just start carving and seeing where that takes you. And keep in the back of your mind ideas like um, teeth are really good ones. Um, my, my younger brother just had uh, cracked a couple crowns and had to have them removed. The painkiller that they used only lasted for about 15 minutes, but the whole process took about an hour and a half, and he was extraordinarily uncomfortable. So, of course, as brothers, all of us had to ridicule him uh, for his discomfort. But uh, teeth are a really good way to look at this. Uh, some other ones are, like I said, bones, uh, sea urchins, um, coral forms, uh, any, any type of thing like that where you see that smoothness and the organic th um, forms of something where if you don't know what it is, it starts becoming something completely different because you don't have a context to view it. And as you work on this, if there's an area that you think is really fantastic, keep working on that area and um, emphasize it more. If there's an area that you don't like so much, maybe you can cut it off. But uh, be really careful with, with how you do this and allow the foam as you work on this to speak to you as you work on it. Maybe you have a very strong impression of what you want to do, but the, the foam as you work with it and you feel it, it wants to do something different. That's okay. Let it be different. So you're not going to be graded on how close you get to your original maquette if you make one. You're not even going to be graded with the maquette. You are going to be graded with the final form. Okay, so how to get to that final form is up to you. If you have uh, an old soldering iron that nobody cares about, and you don't mind the smell of burning plastic, use that to start carving on it. Uh, uh, whatever you can think of. So I want you to play, look at the different artists in the background section of this module and use that to kind of inform you a little bit about what the possibilities are. And then think about organic forms like teeth and uh, sea forms and stuff like implants and use that to inform how you develop this. And just um, allow this to kind of generate, uh, generate itself as you're working. I think that would be... That'll end up being very interesting, I think. All right, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was paper mache. How many of you have done paper mache before? All right, excellent. Emily, are you an expert in guashu? Oh, okay, I was just wondering. No. <laughs> okay, because that's that's a guashu stone, and that's what you're yeah. doing. Yeah. Okay. Gotta, I gotta be stimulated in multiple different directions, sound and you know. <laughs> yeah, just to stay awake because your teacher has a boring voice. I get it. That's fine. no. Whatever. My feelings are not hurt. No, but but that even the silhouette of that is a good way to um, a stepping off point for the structure you're you're carving. Paper mache, what you've got in your kits, you have like a plastic container that has um, goo in it. That's the, the wood glue. Then you also have a bag of flour. And essentially, a paper mache is 
one part water, one part glue, one part flour. And by volume, they're about the same. And I, I would mix it. When you work on this, I would recommend everybody get some cheap plastic gloves that don't have holes in them and use that. Because especially if you have hair on your knuckles like I do, when this stuff dries, it is a booger and a half to get off and it's very painful. So um, the wood glue, as long as you clean up quickly while it's still wet, uh, it clean up is a breeze. If you let it dry, cleanup sucks. Just keep that in mind. So what I would recommend is putting down a painter's tarp, which is just cheap plastic, get a gar plastic garbage bag, put that down and work on a surface like that. Use clothes that you either borrow from a family member or you bought at DI so that if they get glue on them, you can throw them away or give them back to your family member. And uh, just be aware that you're gonna probably make, be making a mess. I did have a couple of videos. There's a guy that sh uh, process video that shows a guy how, um, that shows how a guy does this. You're basically gonna mix up the paper mache Mix it to get rid of as many lumps as possible. And you can use like a DI whisk. I would not use an expensive one uh, to kind of whisk it a bit. But you want to get as many lumps out as you can. The way I do this is I'll mix a batch up, get uh, my hands in there, get as many lumps out as possible, and then put a lid on it, come back about an hour or two later. A lot of the air bubbles have come, down, come out, and a lot of the, the lumps are gone. Just um, very carefully go through and squish as many lumps as possible. And then you can start doing your paper mache. Uh, some of the materials you can use for your paper mache, you have a little bit of newsprint. Newspaper is really good. Some of the other things that I think are really good are paper towels. That works really well. You, you uh, tear the paper towels uh, in the length of the grain. And that is usually along the edge that's not perforated. Another thing that I've seen people do is uh, sheets that they bought from DI and uh, tear or cut those into three quarter inch strips and use those. That's really good too. You let those soak in the paper mache goo for a while. And then as you pull it out, you kind of squish it, uh, the strip between the fingers that you're not using to pull the strip out to get the excess off. And then you drape that over your piece and then you kind of work it in to the surface of the piece that you're, that you're covering with paper mache. And you can wrap it around. Uh, the glue will usually hold it in place. But if you're, if you're wrapping all the way around, one of the best ways to hold it in place is to uh, secure it on itself again. You know, you have the, the leading edge go back to the anchoring edge and overlap it. And that usually will hold it its, in, uh, itself in place. I also will scoop up a little bit with two fingers and use that, massage it in the areas to get it in tight. And you want this to, to be a, a smooth expression over your, your uh, the form that you carved. Again, make sure you take a photo after you're done with your carving and before you do your paper mache, all right? Because these are two separate assignments, but you're using the same thing for both. So after you're done with your carving, you smooth it out with your sandpaper, you're ready to go, take a photo of that, and then, all right? And again, do not do the paper mache on expense, over expensive carpet. Make sure you cover all your work surfaces. Make sure you wear gloves if you can get a hold of them. And uh, look at videos on YouTube on how to do paper mache. I'd be doing a demonstration for you in class, but we're not meeting in class, so that's kind of out of it. Um, I will I'll look up some more videos on doing paper mache as well and send that to you. If the recipes are different, that's fine. If you need to make more of your own paper mache, that's fine too. You can, as long as you're using something like um, an acetate-based glue, like Elmer's glue, it, it works really well. And you can combine multiple uh, paper mache recipes as long as you have that this the glue that smells the same as that uh, wood glue that you've been given. Okay, uh, that that smells the important thing because that will show that they are compatible. All right, as we are winding up, does anybody have any questions? Would you guys think about questions that people that didn't attend today might have? And uh, give me three questions that somebody else might have. So I'm just looking for three different people to ask one question apiece 
that they think somebody else who just got into the meeting might ask. Somebody might ask um, for the discussion, do we have to comment on other people's posts? We know that we don't have to, but they might not know that if they weren't here. <laughs> Excellent. No, that's a really good question. And even people that are in this meeting might have might have that question in the future. If I'm not asking you to um, comment in the discussion description, you don't have to comment. And if later I come back and say your doc points for not commenting, just take a screenshot of that thing and email it to me and say, hey, but there's no no place for you uh, where you didn't ask that in the description. Yeah, for, for a couple of these uh, discussions, I have to use the discussion thing just so you can share what you've done with other people. It's And that's what you get points for sharing. So yeah, Emily, that's a great question. Thank you. Anybody else? We're looking for two more questions. Uh, if we have to attach our foam carving to the foam base that was provided. That's a really good question too. I would keep one of the skewers out and it might be interesting to keep that in mind because I think when we do the very last thing, the very last one, we're going to be combining everything that you've learned all term, that might be really cool to put that on a base. And if you think about that now, I've, I've seen some people will do things to the base itself as well, instead of just leaving it a block where it kind of combines or with or emphasizes the, the foam carving. But that may be something to keep up in mind later. But yeah, Tanner, the answer is no. For this thing, you don't have to. I've also seen people use that base though to kind of support it as they did their paper mache. And that's a good idea too. And then, you know, you can put uh, paper towels over that base, use the skewers to kind of support your object as you're doing paper mache. And then when you're all done, instead of having to scrape off the base, you just uh, pick off the paper towel and throw it away. Because that's what all the glue drops on. So Tanner, excellent question. And we're looking for a third question now. Um, I guess one question that I actually had to, um, some of the like modules say to go and like post the pictures that we took in the discussion, but there's not like a discussion for each module though. Okay, that's, there's, there should, should, there should have been a discussion on each one that says that. That is a really good solid question. Would you um, just send me an email? after we're done and tell me which modules are like that. Because um, for a class like this, where we don't get to actually see each other, it would be a really good thing to have everything put into discussion so that you can share it. So Oliver, would you mind emailing me which modules that those are? Yeah, will do. Okay, that, that's, that's great because I would like everybody to do that. And again, um, if the discussion is not there and it says something like that, you're not going to get docked points for not putting it in because I don't have it available for you. But yeah, Oliver, thank you very much for pointing that out. That's good. All right, guys, um, that brings us to the end. Or Tanner, did you have anything else to say? Oh, I was just going to say I emailed you. I don't know if he's talking about the same thing, but I emailed you about one of the things where it was like, go respond to like two other students' artwork, but it wasn't up. And you were just saying, if it's not up, don't worry about it. Yeah, if it's not up, don't worry about it. Um, I think that we're, what we're going to be doing, I, I, for this class, I was having everybody respond to discussions in the regular stuff, in the regular term. But since this is so much shorter, I, I did remove some of those discussions where you had to respond. 
I think that what we're going to be doing is uh, there is uh, contemporary processes slash um, conceptual art one. And I think at that one, I will have people respond. And the very last one, I think I will have people respond. But all the others, um, if it's if it's like Tanner and Oliver said, if it's not in the discussion, even though I mentioned it in the module, um, you're not going to be docked any points for not doing it because it's not there to do. Okay, but that that would be the reason why. If it's missing, it's because it's something I removed. Okay, so excellent observation, Tanner, Oliver. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Okay, great. That brings us to the end of another scintillating Teams meeting. I know you guys were just super thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, so as you go back on for the, the rest of your week, uh, just do the best you can. There's uh, Keep me in the loop as things transform and maybe things aren't turned in, but I will be uh, caught up on grading by Friday night so everybody will know where they stand. And this first couple of weeks has been a whirlwind, and I'm really sorry about that, but it really helps make it so that the rest of the term is super easy. And you guys can go back and rework stuff if you want to. But the, the last project that we have will be this carving that you are working on now. You're going to be revisiting it with paint and texture and doing everything else you can think about. And then any other stuff, you'll be uh, reassessing. And if you want uh, higher points, revisiting it. OK? All righty. And if you guys have any questions or any more observations about broken links or anything like that, don't hesitate to let me know. So I appreciate your patience with me, and thank you for being here live today. It makes it much more enjoyable for me rather than just talking to a blank screen. So I will look forward to seeing you guys Tuesday. Have fun over the week, the week and over the weekend. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.